One of the coolest structural biology tools that you might not have heard of is this site called PDBSum. It will take a PDB file, either one that has already been solved and is in the PDB, so the protein data bank, or one that is predicted or one that you upload yourself. And what it'll do is it'll show you all the interactions with ligands. It'll show you the interactions between different subunits of the protein. It will show you where there are clefts and pores and tunnels. And it will show you various map types to show you the secondary structure as well as any domains and annotations and bonds and things. So this is a really cool tool. And so I thought I'd just walk you through it. The PDB SOM homepage looks like this, and you have a few different options. One is to stick in the PDB code for a structure that has been experimentally solved and is in the protein data bank. So in this case, this example, I'm using this 7BY9, which is the maladehydrogenase protein from this bacteria bound to oxaloacetate, OAA, and NAD. And I can see various things about the structure in the PDB, but I want to be able to actually see more detailed information and a couple different views. And so I'm going to this PDB sum and I can put in that ID and it'll pull up the information. Alternatively, if there's not a structure solved, you can actually have it find you an alpha fold model by putting in the Uniprot ID. So the Uniprot is the place where there's information about all the different proteins, and so you can go find that. You can also search based on sequence or various other IDs, or what you could do is if you go to generate, you can upload a PDB file. And so if you have some custom PDB file, you can upload it here, and then you stick in your email and it'll send you that. And there's also a standalone version, but I've only ever used the website. But it does really quick. In this case, I went and I put in that 7BY9, that PDB ID, for that entry that we are looking at. And what I get is a page that looks like this. Because this has been an experimentally solved structure, it's going to draw in all the annotations that were accompanying that. The, similarly to how you see those sorts of things, that information about publications, the reaction that it catalyzes, those sorts of things, you're going to see that in this page. We can also see what it contains. So we have these four protein chains, each of which is 311 amino acids. We have four instances each of NAD and oxaloacetate, and there are 34 models that have been modeled. Speaking of modeling, you can go and you can look and see a Ramachandran plot showing you the backbone angles that are in that protein structure file. And so this is going to show you kind of whether the angles are what you would expect for a protein. So those kind of darker regions are the angles that the peptide backbone normally takes for those amino acid combinations. Over here, what we see is that we have this domain architecture. So these are the annotated domains. And then under here, we have the secondary structure. If I click for a larger version, what I see is something like this. It's a little hard to see things right now, so I'm going to shorten this to be showing 50 residues per line. Now I see something like this. You can see that you have the domains annotated, as well as you have this secondary structure. And so when you see these helices, it's indicating an alpha helix. And when you have one of these arrows, then it's going to be a beta strand. And the arrows are going to point in the direction of N to C, and this whole thing is going to be in the direction of the N terminus to the C terminus. That's cool, but we can get an even cooler view if we go over to protein. So because these chains are all identical, it's just showing me one of them, but it's telling me that it's basically the same as all of these. What I see now is I see the actual sequence, and then over the sequence, I see that nomenclature that we saw before where we have the helices and we have the arrows. Now it's actually going to be numbering them. And so you can see that we have H1, helix 1, H2, helix 2, etc. 
we also see that we have these symbols for the beta hairpins as well as these beta turns. So now we get a little more information and it's also going to show us the interactions with those ligands. If you're looking for a little more control over your diagrams, there's also this tool called Enscript and it will take a PDB file. So again, you can kind of put it in a custom one or you can have it fetch one. And what it'll do is it'll actually give you a lot of different options in how you want things formatted. And you can do various things like custom annotations and things. It'll also do alignments and generate structural models where things are mapped based on conservation, things like this. And so really cool tool and it can do a lot more powerful things, but it'll kind of like do a more limited set of things than when you have this PDB sum, which kind of just gives you all this information at once that's been pre-generated. So both these tools are really useful if you want to do one of those kind of secondary structure overlaid over the sequence. Over here, we have a topology map. And so here it's more like a bird's eye view. So we're going to see these alpha helices and we'll see these beta strands. Now it's going to tell us kind of the number of the start and the stop. We have our end terminus and we see the, the kind of linkage of these the relative structures in the protein. And then we have the cylinders are gonna be our alpha helices and these arrows are gonna be our beta strands. So we can see that we've got some parallel beta sheets and we have some anti-parallel beta sheets. And so these types of diagrams are especially good for seeing the beta sheet formations. You can also, if you just want the sequence, the FASTA file, FASTA files, they start with this arrow and then they just have this, some like the header line and then the sequence. Now let's go and let's actually look at the interactions with those ligands. So we have the NAD and then we have the oxaloacetate. So right now we're showing the NAD, but I can also click on the oxaloacetate if I want information about that. This part up here is just validating that the ligand looks good in the structure. And so sometimes people try to model in a ligand because they want it to be there, but it's not actually there. But this seems to actually be there and it seems to be geometrically solid and all that stuff. And so here it's going to show us the interactions. And so we get, we can see that we have some salt bridges formation, some hydrogen bonds, things like this. It'll show us the distances between some of the atoms, um, but not all of them. And so if we want all of them, I'll show you how we can get a list of interactions. These are gonna be the non-bonded interactions and then these are kind of like more the bonded interactions. So your salt bridges, your hydrogen bonds, that sorts of things. If I go to this list of interactions, now I'm gonna get those atom to atom distances and I'll see it, it's going to be broken up by the types of contacts. So hydrogen bonds, non-bonded contacts, et cetera. That was the NAD. Now let's go to the oxaloacetate. We're going to see something very, very similar. Here we have, we can see that we've got the salt bridges and we've got these hydrogen bonds and more non-bonded contacts. And it's telling us this is equivalent. All these are equivalent in the different subunits. We go to list of interactions. Again, we'll see this and we can see the distances. That's to the ligand, but you can do similar things between the different protein subunits. That was for the ligands, but you can do similar things between the protein subunits if you have an oligomeric protein where you have multiple subunits, multiple chains. In this case, we have a homo tetramer, so there are four identical chains but they're going to have different interfaces. So we can have A to B, A to C, A to D, D to B, D to C, D to A, you get the point. And we can have different types of interactions. So we can have salt bridges, disulfide bonds, hydrogen bonds, or non-bonded contacts. And so they, they're very good about giving you a key so you can tell what's what and color coding things. If we come down here, we can get more information. So we can see the number of residues that are at the interfaces between these subunits, the size of the interface between them, and the number of different types of bonds, as well as the non-bonded contacts.
works. And again, it's telling us these chains are equivalent in their sequence. But the interfaces are going to be different. And so if we click on one of these interfaces, say, now we'll get more information. We see the types of different bonds, and we can actually see the residue to residue contacts. And we can get a list if we want a list, just like we did before. We could get a PDF if we want a PDF. And then we could go and we could look at these different interfaces and see maybe which ones of these look stronger or weaker or that sorts of things and the different types of bonds between them. That was looking at the presence of things. Now let's look at kind of like the absence of things, those spaces in the protein. And so they can have these kind of like shallow clefts, binding sites and things like this, as well as pores where there are connected internal spaces going through the structure. So those are gonna be longer pores. And then you can have tunnels, which are gonna be interior spaces connected with the protein surrounding. You might be wondering, well, what are the characteristics of these clefts? Does, is it something that maybe something would bind to? And so you can see the different types of residues in these different clefts, the biophysical properties, they're colored by the biophysical properties. And then you can see where things might bind, what types of surfaces you have, various things like this. But I really like these protein-protein interface because I work with the tetrameric maldehyde dehydrogenase as well, as well as then you have the interactions with the ligands. And so this could be a really great starting point if you're trying to think about something like site-directed metagenesis. What amino acids might I want to change to, say, disrupt the oxaloacetate binding, that sort of thing. So this is a really cool tool. And again, you can use it with a PDB structure that's experimentally solved, or you could go and you can actually generate based on a PDB, custom PDB file that you put in there, maybe even one that you made with some molecular modeling tools. So it's a really useful tool, and I don't think that many people know about it. So I just wanted to show you it. So you can get all sorts of different representations of the protein. You can get the domain architectures. You can get the secondary structure layouts. You can get Ramachandran plots. You can get topology diagrams and secondary structure mapped over the sequence. So lots of really cool things in addition to having those interfaces mapped for you between different protein subunits, proteins and ligands. It'll also do DNA and RNA, as well as predict these various surfaces. So hope you find this helpful and now you know about it.